Hey, good morning, South Point Church. How are we doing today? Good day, good, good day, great day, as we would say with our, our son, Benjamin. Hey, before we get started, I just want to expand on something that Young had talked about. We've got this thing called Next that happens after the service, and here's what that is. We have two values that are really strong for, for me and for us as a church, and that's authenticity and transparency. And so Next is designed for us to be authentic and transparent about who we are as a church. And so it's not like a membership class. It's not anything like that. It's us saying, this is us. This is the dirty laundry. This is how we do things. This is who who we are and what our values are. And then you guys get an opportunity to say, hey, I I like that or I I don't like that. And I want to try somewhere else. But that's really why we kind of designed that. So that happens after the service at 1030. Pastor Linton leads that. He's amazing. Um, so if you want to stick around for that, then, then please do. Okay, let's get into our message today. Ever wonder why this is a series that we've been talking about uh, for the last couple weeks? And I've had a lot of great feedback from you guys that this has been a great series, that we've been answering some tough questions, and we've been addressing some issues that maybe haven't been addressed before. It's been resonating with people. And, and today we're talking about something that maybe some of you will identify with really well, and then some of you won't be able to identify with it at all. But the first question that I would ask is, how many of you have ever felt the presence of God? So for a lot of people, I could say, hey, how many of you have felt the presence of God this morning? And you would raise your hand. You would say, yeah, worship was, was amazing. You know, I felt God's presence here. Or there may be a time in your past where you could say, man, I remember a moment where I felt the presence of God. You know, I, I go back to one of my favorite moments where I felt God's presence. It was the moment that I gave my life to Jesus. And I was at a a camp, like a a Christian summer camp. And it was the summer going into my eighth grade year. And they had an altar call on a Monday. And they traditionally did an altar call on Thursdays. And so here I'm sitting in my seat, and they did this altar call. And I thought, I'm not ready for this. It was something God had been banging on my heart. But I thought, I'm not ready for this. And my friends were up praying around the front. And one of them turned and said, Chris, can you come and pray with us? And as soon as I got in that huddle of guys, I just, I broke. And just the Holy Spirit fell on me. And I gave my life to Jesus. And I experienced the presence of God just in such an amazing, tangible way, unlike any other way before. And there's been times from, from then until now that I felt the presence of God so many different times. But before we go on in this message, before I I continue to take us through feeling the presence of God, first, I I just want to address for people, why should you feel the presence of God? Like, what, what exactly even is the presence of God? And the presence of God is when you are, just like it says, don't overcomplicate this thing, you are in the presence of God. And so why would I, as a pastor, want to teach you about the presence of God? Well, because I believe that God is a loving God. He's our creator. He sent his son to die for us. He provides us with everything that we need. He gives us everything that we need. He takes care of us. He watches over us. He's involved. There's nothing in the world that he's not involved in. So why would I not want you to be able to stand in the presence of God? So that's why we have this message today. That, that's why I'm, I'm talking to you about this today. That's, that's why this matters Because whether you've never felt it or whether you have a million times, I want you to stand in the presence of God. It's a good place to be. And so, going on this question, how many of you have ever felt the presence of God? The next thing I would ask is, how do you know that you have felt the presence of God? So how how do you know that you've felt this? Now, this can be kind of... Kind of tricky. You know, maybe it's you feel the tingles, or maybe you feel goosebumps, or, or maybe, you know, something else happens. And I thought of an example. My wife's in the moms and babies room right now, so I can say anything in the world that I want to. And I thought of an example last night, and I told her about this example, and she said, I can't believe you're going to say this. But so here it goes. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. So let me say this. We all know what it's like to feel the presence of a fart. (laughs) When someone has crop dusted a room in front of you, when someone has left a trail behind them and you walk into the presence of a fart, you know you're in the presence of that. 
There's no doubt in your mind. You can smell it. You can feel it. It impacts your soul. It impacts something about you. There's no question about it. See, wouldn't it be amazing if the presence of God was the same way? If when you walk through those doors, you walk through God's little fart cloud of holiness, and you felt the presence of God. Now see, that wasn't so bad of an example. I thought that, that's actually the best way to, to explain this here. I'm just going to let you guys laugh for a minute. <laughs> Somebody over here is getting a good. Um, no. So I, I want you guys to, I want to normalize this thing for you. Like that, that's what I'm trying to do here with you. I want to normalize the presence of God. It's not tricky. It's not weird. Like it, it's, 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 not, um, it's not something that we can't attain or we can't get to or we can't find. And, and when you do come into the presence of God, sometimes you do feel something. You know, sometimes when you're in worship and, and you're in here and you're singing, whether you have a relationship with Jesus or you don't, or whether you're new here or you've been here a hundred times, you know, somebody uh, is singing a song up here and it just hits you in a certain way and you're like, man, I really feel the, the presence of God here. You know, there, God does this, this very humbling thing with me where when I have a really like an encounter with the Holy Spirit, then it just like makes me cry. And many of you that have been here for a couple years, you've seen me just bawl my eyes out here on stage because I feel the presence of God falling on this room. And, and what's special about that is that means that like, God is with us, like that really God is always with us, but I feel that the room has now stood with God because God never, God, God never leaves our presence. It's us realizing that we're in his presence or us realizing or us not being in his presence because maybe we're distracted. And then that brings me to another question. Whose fault is it if you did not feel the presence of God? Whose fault is that? It, maybe it's you think that, okay, it's my fault because I was distracted because during worship I was sitting there on my phone or, or, or the alarm went off and I was on the phone with ADT trying to tell them that no, we're here or, or whatever. Maybe it's your fault because you felt like you were distracted or maybe it's, it's God's fault. You could think, hey, this is God's fault here because he's holding back from me. Why, why do I not feel God? I'm desperate here. It's been a hard week. It's been a tough week. I come to church. This is where I'm guaranteed to get the tinglys. This is where I'm guaranteed to feel good and feel full of joy, but I, I don't. So what is God doing to me? Or may, maybe another option to this is, is we just didn't sing a song that you liked. You know, we sang three songs, three, four songs, and you didn't really like any of them. So kind of like, well, we should get rid of Toboho, who's our, our, our worship leader. He's fired. He's gone. Because he didn't pick the right songs. See, it's, it's, I want you to think about this. Like, who, who's, whose fault could it be that you didn't feel this? And so then that brings me to the question, which is the title of today's message, which is, what do you do when God feels far away? And that's what we're going to answer today. When you walk out of here today, you'll know how you handle this. What do you do when God feels far away? See, if God feels far away from you, I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that you're actually in, in good company. You are not alone. Hear that. If God feels far away from you today, you are not alone. There's actually, I'll, I'll give you three really great examples of, of this. If we look in, in Psalms here, I've, I've got a verse for you. In Psalms 88, 13 through 14, the psalmist here is writing. And you can just hear the aches in his heart. You can just hear him like aching for God, like, God, I want to feel your presence. And he says, but I've cried out to you, O Lord, for your help. Anyone been there in that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Lord, I've cried out to you for help. And in the morning, my prayer will come to you. I remember mornings of waking up at 4 a.m. and getting on my knees and crying out to God for help and, and just asking him for help. I, I've been there here. I know this. You know, many parents in here, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're praying for your kids. You're, you're crying out for help to God. And, oh, Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? This psalmist here, if, if you look at the entire psalm, Psalm 88, and you look at the, the context of why it was written, 
This psalmist has written this whole chapter about this idea or about this feeling that he feels disconnected from God. He feels like God has cast him out and that God has just cast him away. And then another good example is King David. King David is a guy that that I love reading about in the Bible. And many times, if you just flip through the book of Psalms, you'll see in one Psalm, David is asking God, where are you, God? Because this other king, King Saul, is coming after me, and he's trying to kill me. And Lord, you've anointed me to be king, but here I am running for my life, and I'm hiding in caves, and someone is pursuing me to kill me. And then in another Psalm, David will be praising God. And so many times through the book of Psalms, David is saying, God, where are you? Where are you at? Another example for you, just so you know you're in good company, is the Apostle Paul. He wrote a good bit of the New Testament. Paul was called, he was struck blind. And he, he was called to, to leave a life of pursuing or, or of prosecuting Christians to pursuing Jesus. Paul was called to go out to the Gentiles, which are the people that were the non-Jews, which are basically the people that needed Jesus, that needed to know the truth of Jesus. Paul gets called to these people. But it takes Paul three years. Then it takes him another 14 years. He's a tent maker. And so I couldn't imagine Paul... Being like, I've been called to do this, but I'm sitting here making tents. Lord, what are you doing? And Paul even reaches out to God and he says, God, I've got this thorn in my flesh. Paul had like a, we don't know if it was a sin or an ailment or a physical problem or issue, but he would reach to God and say, God, take this from me. And God wouldn't do it. In fact, God said, shut up, Paul. You're going to have it forever. You just need to deal with that. And the, the, the last example, which is the most heartbreaking for me is Jesus. See, Jesus knows what it feels like to feel far away from God. He, he knew it. So if you feel far from God, you're in good company because you're in the company of Jesus. See, when Jesus hung on the cross, he, he had spent his entire life dedicating his life to fulfilling the prophecies of the Bible, to, to loving his Father, his Heavenly Father, God. Jesus did no sin. He did nothing wrong. He gave of himself of everything. Jesus was the perfect person. And this perfect person is hanging on the cross. And while Jesus has got his hands nailed to the cross and he's got his feet nailed to the cross and he's sitting there and he's been beaten and he's in agony and his skin is falling off of his body because he's been whipped with with these ropes with with glass and metal in them and and he's had to carry this wooden cross up a hill and, and he's been lifted up and he's sitting there and there's a moment where Jesus takes on the sin of the world Your sin, my sin, the sin of those that have come and the sin of those that will come in the future. He takes on all of that sin. And in that moment, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, my God, my God, I don't feel your presence with me. My God, my God, why have you turned your back from me? See, when Jesus took on all of our sin, he was made imperfect so that we have the opportunity to accept God's grace and become perfect and enter into the presence of God. But see, Jesus felt far from God. But the the good news for us is that we don't have to remain feeling far from God. Because like I said in the beginning, God's presence actually never leaves us, ever. You can't do anything to drive God away from you. I've tried, believe me. I've tried with all of my heart to just push God out of my life in a way, and it just never happens. It's like trying to push a cloud. It just doesn't work. It doesn't move. And so today, I want to give you three reasons, three possible reasons why we might not feel the presence of God. Now, this isn't every single reason why you may not feel the presence of God, but this is some reasons why you may not feel the presence of God. And as we go through these three, I just hope, I really would challenge you to try and identify with one of them. I'd like for you to examine your life and to think, have an open mind, have an open heart, and think to yourself, is this me? Is there some of this in me? As I was preparing for this message, I could find some of all three of these things in me. And if some of what we're going to talk about is in you, then I want you to know that that's a good thing. 
Because then you can point to something that you can do or work on to feel like you're in the presence of God. I mean, it would be horrible if you walk out of the service today and you think, I learned nothing. Chris talked about nothing that applies to me in my life. My life is hopeless. I don't want you to walk out that way. And so I believe that even though these three things may not address every issue that you have, these three things will address some issues that you have. I promise you'll be able to identify with some of these things. So the, the first thing, the first thing that, that we do that can make us not feel the presence of God is that we can over-sensationalize God's presence. We can over-sensationalize God's presence. Now, what this means is that when we think to ourselves, if I'm in the presence of God, then I should feel the tinglies, or I should feel something happening in me. I should feel something like a, a, a wind or a, a motion or, or, or just something. Something should happen, right? Because when I go uh, to my kitchen and I'm making eggs for breakfast, I don't feel anything there. You know, I just feel like I'm making eggs for breakfast. So when I come to church and I sing worship songs, why should I feel the same way that I felt this morning making eggs for breakfast? No, I should feel different. There should be something different here. And in fact, there, there's a, a verse that we'll look at, and it talks about a sign. See, we, 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 want, a, we want a sign. We're like, God, give me a sign that you're there. Give me a sign that you're talking to me. Give me a sign that you hear my prayer. Lord, if you want me to, to do this or go to this place, or, or if you want me to break up with this girl, then you got to give me a sign. You got to give me a real, real specific sign. You know, but we ask God for these signs. We say, Lord, if you want me to do this, if you want me, Lord, give me a sign to know what job to take or what school to go to. Give me a sign on whether or not I should forgive my family or forgive a brother, or forgive a friend. Lord, give me a sign that you're still in my life. And so there, there's a verse in, in John that we'll look at. Jesus, and he, Jesus talks about this, and, and Jesus kind of addresses this right, right at our heart. So this is coming from, from the mouth of, of Jesus here in John 6.30, and it says, So they, they said to them, so this is people actually talking to Jesus. They said to him, what sign, which is a, an attesting miracle, so they're looking for a miracle. It says, what sign will you do that we may see it? And believe you, what supernatural work will you do as proof? See, they needed to see in order to believe. They needed a supernatural, not natural, not normal, not every day, not in your kitchen cooking eggs kind of sign. They needed a supernatural thing for Jesus to do for them to see as proof that Jesus was working and moving and that his presence was there and his presence was with them and that he did everything that he said that he was going to do. They needed a sign, a miracle that was supernatural to work as proof. You see, there's a problem with this. There's, there's a big problem with this. See, this is where we sit a lot. And a lot of our prayers sit here. Lord God, I'm praying for my child. Please give me a sign today that, that you love my son or you love my daughter. Show up in their life today. Do something in their life today so that I know that you're there. I know that you're listening. Lord, I pray for my, my grandmother, my grandfather, or my friend that's in the hospital. Lord, work a miracle. Do something miraculous today so that I know you hear my prayers. Lord, let your presence be in that room by healing them. Lord, I pray for my job, this job that I hate, this job that I feel like I shouldn't be in. Give me a miraculous sign today. Let the company that I want to work for call me and give me an opportunity to work somewhere else. Lord, I pray over my car. Give me a sign today that the car is going to work. Cancel out. In Jesus' name, we, we cancel out the check engine light. Lord, we want a sign, a miracle. But the problem with this is this, is that signs take away your need for faith. See, signs take away your need for faith. 
Josh, put that on the screen for them so that they can see that. Because I want you guys not only to hear that from my voice, but I want you to see it on the screen because it's, it's that important. See, a sign takes away our need for faith. If we, if we only reacted, if we only believed in God when we saw God do something, well, then we wouldn't need faith for anything. See, if God answered all of my prayers, then I would never have had my faith built. Because all of my prayers come with a condition. Lord, if you're there, show me a sign. There's a condition. God, if you are doing X, then you will show me this, this, this Y. So there's a condition to my prayer request. And if all of my conditions are met in order for me to trust and believe in God, then that means I don't need any faith at all. All I have to do is continue to give God conditions to my prayers. And if, hey, if he's a real God, if he loves me, then sure, he's just going to show up and he's going to do the sign and he's going to speak to me. He's going to do a miraculous thing. And then what, is, what good is faith? I don't need faith. But see, God wants us to have faith. He wants us to, to, to not get everything that we want so that we have to believe in him, so that we have to trust in him. See, our, 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 our faith is like us maturing. It's, it's us maturing as people. You know, when you're in a relationship with your spouse or wife or, or boyfriend or girlfriend, the more that you learn about each other, the more that you mature in your relationship, the more that you trust each other, the more faith that you have in each other. If you're here at this church and, and you've come and you're new and you've been coming, you know, a couple Sundays, hopefully as you learn to trust us and as we enter into a relationship together, you know, your faith grows in us as a church and what we stand for. But see, God wants us to have faith. So I just want to say this before we move on to the next thing. I want you to examine your prayer life. whether And, and by that, it, it could be panic prayers. Like, Lord God, please let, let her not be pregnant. Give me a sign on that. If she's not pregnant, then I will always and forever commit my life to you. I will never cuss. I will never do anything wrong again. Lord, I will always, 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 always love you. If she's not pregnant. Amen. I got some amens out there. I want, I want you to question your prayers. And say, are my prayers built on signs? Are my prayers built on faith? Are my prayers built on me seeing the sign that God is there? Or is my prayer built on me having faith in God despite the sign? See, your faith is so important. And faith is just you believing in something that you can't see. You believing in something that has yet to happen. You believing in God. It's through faith that we are saved. Because we have faith that God's grace is good for us. That's, that's faith. That's what, what Jesus wants. Jesus doesn't just want to take away a sign so that it makes life harder for you, so that you just have to have more faith. No, that's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is saying, this faith thing is not only connected to your prayer request, but it is connected to your salvation. It is connected to the future and the plan that I have for you. It is connected to your joy. It is connected to your completeness. It is connected to your relationship with me, your loving Heavenly Father. And so Jesus is saying it's not just about the sign. It's about your faith being built so that you can be made complete in Jesus. See, do you see how much more Jesus wants for you? Do you see that, that sometimes when he doesn't give you a sign, it's because he wants more for you? But see, that rubs us in like a weird way that kind of rubs up against us like sandpaper. Because if you've been in a place like I've been where you, sit, where, where you just, life is hard and things hurt. And you're just praying and you're praying and you're like, God, show up. And Lord, I feel like I haven't been in your presence forever. Uh, where are you? Where are you? And you're just calling to God and God is not answering a prayer. And you come to church and the preacher's telling you about, like, here's three things you can do to have, you know, renewed faith in God or three things you can do for this or for that. And you walk out of the service and you think, okay, that was, you know, that was really great. But the next morning you wake up in the morning and you find yourself trying to hold on to truth. You're trying to hold on to a truth that somebody told you in church or a friend gave to you or a Bible verse that popped up on your Bible app or something, but you find yourself saying, but I want to feel you. I want to feel that your presence is there. 
God, I want to feel it. God, desperately, let me just feel it. Give me a moment where I feel that you're there working, doing, moving, saving, handling just my world with your hands. Let me just feel it. And see, that, that's an honest place where we find ourselves. It's a desperate place. That's a mom with a sick child. That's somebody who's lost a job. That, that's, that's somebody who's, who's lost a family member. That's somebody struggling with depression and anxiety. That's somebody that's struggling with their self-worth. That's somebody that's being bullied. That's somebody that doesn't feel accepted. That's somebody that feels alone. This is somebody that we can all identify with at some point in our lives where we've been there and we've said, but God, I just want to feel you. Why don't I feel you? But there's a reason that we don't always have to feel God. And it's this, it's that our feelings are not the only evidence of the presence of God. Praise God for that. Because if that was true, we'd all be in a mess. Because our our feelings are not the only evidence of the presence of God. If you always felt God, you would not need faith. See, the other thing about your feelings is they can't be trusted. If you trusted your feelings and not faith or not wisdom, then you'd all be, you would have married the wrong person. Some of you did anyway, but God, you know. (laughs) Just want to make sure you guys are still, are still with me. You know, but can you look back on your life? Can you look back and can you say, man, if I had gone with my gut, if I had trusted just my feelings here, oh my word, I would have ended up in such a bad place. Praise the Lord that my feelings don't dictate what God does. Praise God that that my feelings don't, don't determine whether God shows up in my life or whether I feel his presence in my life. You know those moments when you're laying on the ground or, or you're sitting there saying, but God, I want to feel you. God is saying, I don't want you to trust your feelings. I want to build your faith. I want you to trust it in me, not in what you feel. That, that's called dying to yourself, to put it bluntly. That's just called, you know what? I, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice the way I feel. I'm going to own it, God. I feel horrible. God, I feel alone. God, I feel like you're not there. God, I feel like the world is up against me. God, I feel like nothing's going to change. God, I feel like a prisoner. God, I feel trapped. But you know what? That's the way I feel. And I'm going to just let it go. And guess what, guys? You're still going to feel the same way. I'm not, I'm not promising a magic trick. I wish I could. And sometimes some of you, when you do that, God will just, boom, take it from you. But, that, but not everyone. Because God wants to build your faith. Because his presence is with you. And I, I just want you to know that when your heart breaks, his heart breaks. When you're, when you're broken, when you're just desperate to feel God, He's even more desperate for you to know that you're loved. He'll never leave you. So if we go to the next thing, this is another reason why maybe you don't feel the presence of God. And it's maybe your heart has hardened. Maybe you've got a hard heart. So I'll explain this through a verse here in Matthew 13. And so th- this, is, this is Jesus who's speaking here. And, and he says in verse 14, In them the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says... So, so this is, give you a little context. This is Jesus teaching. So Jesus is now teaching, and he's teaching out of the book of, of Isaiah. So Josh, you can go to the next verse. Thank you. So the reason that this is all capital is not because I was tired and the caps lock key was stuck, but this is Jesus teaching from the Old Testament. And so if you look in many Bible translations, this will be capitalized because Jesus is specifically quoting a a part of Scripture from the book of Isaiah. And so he says, You will hear and keep on hearing, but never understand. You will look and keep on looking, but never comprehend. Then he goes on to say, For this nation's heart has grown hard. And with their ears, they hardly hear, 
and they have tightly closed their eyes. And then it goes on to say, otherwise, so he's saying, hey, if the heart was not hard, if the eyes were not tightly closed, if the ears were not clogged, otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn to me and I would heal them spiritually. And so the question is, is is your heart hardened? Because what Jesus is saying here is that when your heart is hardened, he has a hard time uh, opening your eye. You can't see him. You can't hear him. And so what are some of the things that could cause you to have a hardened heart? Maybe it's, it's you've got an issue with, um, uh, you've been hurt by the church at one point in time. Maybe you've had something that, that a person has hurt you. Or maybe you've had friends that have hurt you. Or maybe you've come to a church and you were ignored because someone didn't see you and someone didn't greet you. Or wh- whatever it could be. It could be years of a jaded relationship with somebody. But we, we've all got some hardness in our heart. We all have something that over time builds up and, and builds resentment, builds, oh, bitterness. That's a big one. Bitterness is a, is a, is a huge one. And so the, the number one cause of a hardened heart here, it, it's not bitterness. It could be. But the number one cause of a hardened heart, and, and this is going to hit you guys, and you have, we have to deal with this. You have to deal with what's coming next. The number one cause of a hardened heart is ongoing sin. It's ongoing sin. Now, this is not asking you to be perfect. If you sin, then uh, it, it doesn't mean that your heart's automatically hard and that you don't have access to Jesus. Because when I put this on the screen, some of you sinned right away. And so you've not cast yourself out of God's presence. We all sin. We've all sinned today. We've all done it. We're all in the same, we're all in the same camp. This ongoing sin that I'm talking about, this is something that you know is in your life that you just continue to let be there. You've not admitted it. You've not addressed it. You're not trying to address it. You've not prayed for forgiveness. You're not working on it. You've just kind of said, you know what? This is there. It's in the background. This right here is, 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 is that sin of pride where you just feel prideful. And you won't let that go. Or this is that addiction to pornography, which is totally fine because no one's in your bedroom with you. It doesn't impact your life outside of your bedroom. It's it's fine that it's an ongoing sin because outside of your bedroom, you're fine and no one knows anything about what's going on. And so, hey, you know, you can totally manage it. You can manage this sin. Or maybe it's lust. You know, outside of pornography, there, there's, there's just lusting after people. Maybe it's, it's all, I'll tell you what, what is huge. You know, what, you know what makes this really hard? Is we spend so much time just consuming uh, content that isn't great for us. You know, like on, on TikTok, on YouTube, and I'm not bashing social media at all. In fact, I love what some churches and what some people are doing on TikTok. If you're on TikTok, follow the Bible app. They have an amazing account. And there are people with amazing things on those platforms. Same with YouTube, same with Facebook, same with Instagram. But what we end up doing is we, we doom scroll. We just go through it and we are feeding ourselves constantly with content. That's not great. It's just not great. The things that we're listening to, we're feeding ourselves with content. It's not edifying. It doesn't build ourselves up. It's just not great. And so we have this ongoing thing in our life, this ongoing sin. So let, let me explain it to you like this. I've got a saying that I say, I don't know if Leaf is in here, but if he is, he knows this really, really well. All my kids do. But it, it's, it's don't starve in a grocery store. And so what, what, don't starve in a grocery store, or I'll tell him, don't freeze in a clothing store. So what this means, if you starve in a grocery store, how, how smart are you, you know? The, the idea is solve your own problems, okay? Like, like you're hungry, you know, get something to eat. It, it's, it's trying to get, you know, him and, and people and us and me, you know, anybody. Just kind of open your eyes. It, it would be silly to starve in a grocery store. Same with, with don't freeze in a clothing store. So let's say... Um, that it, it's winter time here. It's been a little bit warm, but we had a. I got to officiate a wedding last night, and this wedding was cold. It was up somewhere um, that I can't pronounce because you guys have an American pastor. But it was on a hill, 
and it was super beautiful, and the wind was blowing like crazy, and it was cold, 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 cold. And so what do you do when it's cold? Well, you, you put something on and you cover up. And so when you put more clothes on and more clothes on, you don't feel the cold. So putting on the clothes protects you from the cold. It keeps the cold from getting into you. Well, the same thing works for sin. If you're covered in sin, then you can't feel God. Because you keep putting sin on and on and on and on. And the more sin you put on, the more that you can't, uh, you can't encounter God, the more that you can't feel God. So the question that, that I would ask you today that I want you to consider is, is there a sin that I have become comfortable with? Is there something in my life that I've become comfortable with? That's an honest question. Odds are there probably is something, and it could be something as silly as, as, a, as a TV show. Like, you know what? I just actually shouldn't watch that TV show. Or it could be something bigger, like dealing with lust or pornography or dealing with an inner pride or dealing with gluttony or dealing with what, whatever it is. But what have I become comfortable with over time? You deal with this here, and I, I promise you there's going to be just a freedom lifted off of you. And you will feel, it's, it's like when you put the jackets on, it doesn't make the cold go away. It just insulates you from the cold. You take the jackets off, the cold is there. It never went anywhere. Same with God's presence. You take the sin off. You confess that sin. You get rid of that comfortable sin. And God's presence, which has always been there, it's never left, it's still there. All of a sudden, you, know, you can feel that. You're hit with it. And so now I'll go on to the third one. This is our last one, and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. And it's, maybe God wants to draw you closer. So maybe simply, you don't feel God's presence because he wants to draw you near to him. And I'll, I'll illustrate this in, in a verse here in, in Acts verse 26. And it says this, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. So God's made everybody. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands and territories. So basically, God has sort of made the world and he's put everybody where they're supposed to be. And then it continues in the next verse and it says... It says, this was so that they would seek God. So God wants to be sought after. Because God's a loving God. He's a God that wants a relationship with you. So he says, seek me. If perhaps they may even grasp for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. See, it's, what, what it's saying there is it's the hard times that inspire you to seek God more. It's those hard times that you go through that inspire you to seek God more. I've got a way to, to illustrate this. Do you guys know the word uh, deprivation? Josh, put deprivation up on the screen for him. So deprivation is, is you not getting something like that you want. So an example of this is, is when you don't eat, you become hungry. Okay, exactly. So when you don't drink, when you don't drink, you become hungry thirsty. To so being deprived of food or being deprived of, of water makes you hungry or it makes you thirsty. So then I would, okay, so then when you don't feel the presence of God, then you want God. You seek God. You run after God. You search for God. See, God's not trying to hide himself from you, but a lot of times God tries to draw us into him. But if he always gives us everything that we want, when we want it, then why would we ever pursue God? It breaks God's heart in those moments when you're crying out to him and begging him to feel the presence of him. But what I want to tell you is don't give up. Don't ever give up. God gives us this amazing promise in Jeremiah 29. Hold this promise for yourself. Write this promise down. Write this verse down. Take a screenshot. But it's Jeremiah 29, 13. It says this. And, and again, I, I love the amplified version of the Bible. If you're new here and you see all these weird brackets and stuff, what the amplified version is doing is it's expanding on the meaning of the word. So it's giving you this great context. And it says, Then, with a deep longing, so that's you, with the deep longing saying, God, I want to feel you. God, I need you. God, I, why won't you show up in my life? God, you've not answered my prayer. You've not, you've not given me what I want. I don't have any signs. I have a deep longing for you. 
You will seek me and you will require me. God says you will require me when you seek me. I require God. Nothing happens in my own doing. It only happens in God's doing. You will seek me. You will require me as a vital necessity. God is so vital. He's like air. We need him. And you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. He goes on. He says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and I will free you and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. I love the part, I will restore your fortunes. You know what? I will restore your joy. I'll restore your brokenness. I'll restore your hard moments. I'll restore you while you're laying on the bathroom floor begging for me. I have a plan to restore you because I'm with you. My presence is with you. My heart is for you. Just keep seeking me. Seek me. Never Never stop seeking me. If you seek me, you'll find me. When you do, I will restore you. That's an amazing promise that we have for ourselves. And then he goes on in this verse to give us an even more amazing promise. And if we, if we keep going in it, it says, And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. See, it's like God's saying, like, I'll bring you back home. I'll bring you back to that place of joy, of love of completeness that you thought you could never find again. Guys, is there a moment or a place in your life that you feel like you could never return to? Maybe it's a place where you loved yourself. Maybe it's a place where you felt loved by others. Maybe it's a place where you felt close to God. God is saying, I'll bring you back. Just never stop seeking me. And see, just because God feels distant, it doesn't mean that God is absent. God is still there. Just because God is distant, it doesn't mean that God is absent. He's still there for you. So my my prayer for you today is is I want to show you those three. Josh, go to our last slide there. These three things here. Over-sensationalizing God's presence. Is your heart hardened? Is God drawing you near to Him? I hope that you find yourself in one of these things. See, it's so important to me that you feel the presence of God. Because God is there. He's with you. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to feel the presence of God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to deal with one of these or all of these or deal with whatever it is that's in your life. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to do that now. I'm going to pray. And when I pray, the band's going to come out and they're going to lead us in a song. And this is such an important moment. It, re- it really is. I, I, I know that, that life happens when you get out those doors. As soon as you walk through those doors, you forget everything that's going on because the kids are yelling and screaming or you're hungry. Or you've got to go do this or do that. Load shedding happens at noon, so you've got to get things ready for those types of things. As soon as you walk out, life happens. Hey, before, please, hang right here. Be present. Be present in this moment. Because I'm going to give you a chance before you leave this room to deal with one of these things that's happening in your heart. And so when I pray, I'll call the band up and we're going to have our prayer team that's going to come up front. And these people are there. They're they're not miracle workers. They're not going to solve your problems. They're not going to do a miracle in your life. They're simply going to enter into whatever it is you need prayer with. They're going to pray with you. They're going to pray for you. They're going to pray with you. When's the last time somebody who loved you, even though they don't know you, put their hand on your shoulder and prayed a prayer for you. You know how good that would feel? Hey, to some of us, that would feel great. If you're introverted, if you don't want that, hey, you don't have to come up here. And it doesn't mean that you're missing out on something. Find God in your seat. God will meet you right where you sit. It's okay. So we just provide these people up here. It's a safe space for you to come and get prayer with somebody. So let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you.